Good day to everybody, attendees and panelists. Welcome to our webinar for today, entitled Export Restriction by India on Non-Basmati Rice, or Implications for the Global Rice Sector. I'm delighted to introduce the ERI Board Chair, Dr. Kal Dukfat, to officially open today's program. Dr. Dukfat, please go ahead. To our esteemed speakers, our online attendees from partner institutions and colleagues, good day and welcome to this very important webinar where we will dissect India's recent non basmati rice ban and its impact on the global rice economy. I am excited to learn from the impressive lineup of experts, fellow economists that we have with us today to give technical and country-specific insights on this very important topic as it impacts multiple facets of rice trade. India is undeniably one of the world's largest producers and exporters of rice, including non-basmati varieties. A major trade policy change in India or any other country of such rank always has impacts on the global rice market. That is what the one observed in 2008 and is observing now. As we all know, rice is a staple food for billions of people around the world. Securing staple, stable supply with stable affordable prices of rice is one of the most important tasks of any government where rice is staple food. Recent movements in the rice market raise concerns of governments and people, not only in importing, but also in exporting rice countries. A lesson I learned from 2008 crisis and these days is that truthful and transparent information of rice production, consumption, stocks, and trade, careful scientific analysis of the situation, and close international cooperation are helpful for governments to take right policy decision, avoiding the panic, which is harmful for everyone. That is why I am really thankful to the group of economists from ERI and all of you for taking time to attend this webinar. I have high hope that our scientific evaluation and analysis of the current situation will help the world go through this difficult period smoothly with low cost. Thank you, and I look forward to learning more about this topic. Thank you, Dr. Fat, for setting the scene for that. And your experience of, of course, being the Minister for Agriculture in Vietnam for 12 years speaks volumes. And um, I, I really take your, your point so to heart about the importance of price for rice, especially when uh, rice is the staple of the country. And your 
your emphasis that you put on um, how policy is so critical to to deal with this. Um, so very important points, and I think we'll hear lots more on that from our esteemed panelists. So greetings to everybody, and thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Joanna Kane pataka and I'm the Deputy Director General um, at IRI for Strategy, Engagement and Impact, and I'll be the moderator for today. Now, today we have it split into two main panel sessions. Each will be allocated 30 minutes, and that will leave us with 20 minutes for question and answer at the end. Um, so all Zoom participants, you can put your questions in the Zoom Q&A function. Um, please list the name of the panelists you'd like the, Q and, the question to go to, and please add your questions as we go. Don't leave it to the end because we've got a lot of panelists to go through and questions will only be at the very end. So please feel free to add into the Q&A section as we go and panelists will be able to see your questions and prepare. So um, the first panel, we can go straight into that now. The first panel, um, we aim to examine the VANT's impacts on international trade, the impacts on economic stability and the impacts on food security. So really, really critical. Um, firstly is Dr. David Dorr. Now, David is an independent economist um, specializing in food policy analysis, so perfect for this session. David was also previously a senior economist with FAO, and I'm really proud, proud to say also is an IRI alumni. So welcome back, David. <laughs> um, our second panelist today is on this panel session is Dr. Samarendu Mahanti, so Sam. Um, he is currently the director with the um, International Potato Center, the regional director for Asia. Um, but also we're proud to say he's another IRI alumni. And he, Dave, um, Sam was head of head of and, and the senior economist for IRI's social sciences division. So welcome, Sam. Um, and the third of our three um, panelists for the first panel is Dr. Harold Valera. Harold is a scientist and an economic modeler for the Transformative Policies and Investment Unit with IRI right now. So thank you for joining us, Harold. Um, and so kindly note, each of you, you have eight minutes um, to present in total of the questions that I'll, I'll give you. Um, and I'll let you know when you've got one minute left to, to wrap up and summarize the key points you want to make. Um, so let's kick off with Harold, the lucky first. Um, so Harold, there are uh, just a couple of questions I'd like you to address. So you um, are the proud sort of um, leader of the econometric model that we have, and um, you've been able to look at that. And I'd like to ask you, how much of a rise do you see in the prices of rice, given this shock to the market? Um, and also, how much of any world price increase do you expect will transmit to the domestic markets? And which countries do you think might be affected most by this? So over to you, Harold. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon. Magandang hapon po sa that. And thank you for the opportunity to add some few notes on the potential impact of the ingest export price restrictions. So yeah, actually, just right after ingest announcement uh, back in uh, back on uh, last July 20, uh, our team uh, headed by uh, Val Pede, uh, uh, our and our partners at ADB Takashi Yamano uh, actually uh, alerted us, you no, know, and then we immediately run a simulation using our in-house model. Uh, we call it the ED Global Rice Model. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that you know we are using this model now. Uh, and we have uh, Dr. Sam Mohanty as one of the panelists because uh, he led the development of that model back in uh, 2009. So uh, now I think to answer the question on how much of the potential increase in rice, uh, world rice prices, 
So I think it's important to note first that uh, for this is a restriction for non-basmati white rice. And uh, in the last two years, uh, there were about you know, 10 million tons of that. And we use that information uh, to update the our the, the IRI global rice model. In fact, when when some was here, we we only have around 25 countries, but we updated that uh, in light of the fact that you know mostly African countries are affected. Uh, so we added uh, six additional uh, uh, African countries. So uh, using that information, we tried to simulate the uh, you know uh, that. Um, export restrictions by reducing in just total exports by 10 million tons. And yeah, during the first week, we actually got, you know, an increase of about uh, nearly 20% or equivalent to $110. Uh, as you may have noted before in the news, uh, the before before the announcement, uh, the price of Thai price, uh, Thai brokens was at uh, around $534. Uh, Per, per ton, no. But the, what what we got actually is closer to what we have now. So in fact, but I will leave that to you know Sam's presentation later. I think the first slide will uh, his first slide will provide uh, an update on the market. So now I think the the question is, I, I mean, I just want to point out that you know uh, after three weeks uh, there was a substantial increase in uh, type pipe uh, type prices, for example. But it's not as massive. You know, it's, it's, it's not massive uh, either. So uh, that means the market has reacted, but has not panicked. So anyway, uh, with uh, around twenty percent increase in in uh, in the global rice prices, as we have found in the model and as validated from recent uh, trends in type prices. So the uh, it's important to note that the world price is actually a an important uh, potential stabilizing force, but uh, food security may arise uh, if the increase in world prices uh, is transmitted to domestic prices. Now, uh, I think before uh, I, I I provide a comment on how much will be transmitted to domestic prices, I think it's important first to uh, look at you know the trends in 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 domestic prices. For example, uh, before the ban. Let's say uh, before India, India, uh, you know, imposed an export tax back in September 2022. So if we look at the uh, cumulative percentage increase in rice prices, no, from August uh, 2022 to to uh, June uh, 2023, uh, there were actually substantial increases in may, in some of the Asian countries. For example, uh, in the case of Pakistan, it's around um, it's around 76 uh, percent. Uh, I mean, domestic prices also for for Thailand uh, around 14 uh, percent and Vietnam 28 uh, percent. For the Philippines, it's around 44 uh, percent between August 2022 and June uh, sept uh, June 2023. But if we compare, like for example, the uh, the prices uh, of type uh, of the Thai five percent brokens. It, it declined from January to, to March. But if we, if we compare March 2023 to August 2023, uh, still there were substantial increase uh, in, in, if we look at the cumulative uh, uh, percentage increase in rice prices. So for example, uh, so uh, for the Philippines, it's around 10% uh, for, for Thailand, 9% uh, and uh, Vietnam, 33%. Uh, and, and for Pakistan, it's around 90%. But overall, okay, since there will, uh, be, because of the increase in the uh, global rice prices, then domestic rice prices will uh, increase accordingly based on, on, on the results of, uh, of, of our simulation. So, so uh, for, for, uh, for instance, so our simulation suggests that the ingest uh, um, restrictions on non-basmati rice will, uh, Increase the domestic prices in the Philippines and, and Indonesia and other exporting countries in Southeast Asia by by uh, within the range of uh, five percent to to ten percent. Uh, we also look at the price effect in African countries, and the, the our estimate uh, is uh, in the vicinity of uh, ten to fifteen percent. So, 
yeah, I think that's all that I would like to share uh, at the moment in terms of that. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Carol, right on time, that's excellent. Okay, so a lot of data there for people to build on. Um, I see we've already got one Q&A. Thank you, Bruce Tolentino, our another alumni and close um, partner. So I'll encourage the um, panelists to keep watch on those questions and be ready at the end. Okay, over to Sam. Sam, since you are uh, the Asia Regional Director, um, if you can dig a little deeper for us on the Asian perspective, um, we've got some good data there from Harold, but how um, is an increase in these rice prices going to now impact the food security for people in Asia? Also, if you can tackle um, that India says that it will allow special permission for exports based on different countries' food security needs, um, but is there enough to go around? and are uh, enough rice to go around and also are there any long-term repercussions for the Indian export ban and if so what do you think these are so taking these rice this rice data to the next level of, of the impact on food security so thanks Sam over to you uh, thank you Joan and uh, you know it's a pleasure to be here and talking on the ED platform. Let me share my screen. Just let me know when I can. you can see my screen. We can see it. All right, all right. Is it screen mode now? Yes, no. Not yet. Okay, it is, correct? Not yet, now it is, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, Marco, and thank you, Joan, and thank you, Iri, for giving the opportunity to speak. And nice to see all these uh, old friends of Iri. And always, I've moved to potato, but rice is always the first love, and you never leave your first love. So whenever there's some rice stuff going on, I kind of dragged into this thing, uh, you know, to say my, give my comments there. So, so, so Harold already gave some of the remarks on running the model, how it is impacting the, the domestic prices and all these things, and how, it, how the world prices have changed. But I'll, I'll provide some updated information. If you look at this price chart here, it has the the it has India prices and also Thai and Vietnam prices. You, you as as Harold mentioned, the price went up uh, quite a bit, twenty percent in matter of two weeks after the ban. But if you should see last two weeks until yesterday, both Thai and Vietnam, this is twenty five percent broken price. That kind of stabilized. Actually, last two weeks prices have declined. So the, so so I think the impact of uh, Indian non basmati export ban has already been factored into the current price, what you see there. So I don't expect anything because of the ban, any more further increase, unless there's some other new news coming in there. So I think the factor has, the market has already factored into the, the, the effect of the Indian export ban on the global market there. Let me just, you know, what is happening right now is this is my very famous global rice stock use ratio everybody use. And if you see the blue line that's with the China, and if you see the orange bar, that's without China. Quite a bit of difference. Uh, stock use ratio in terms of uh, rest of the world and if you include China. So most of the stock increase uh, has happened, at least on paper. Nobody really can confirm Chinese numbers there uh, unless uh, you know it's, it's not publicly available there. And the, the, the rest of the world stock use ratio actually is more or less safe, hovering around... 15, 18, 20 percent, which has been the case for the last 15 years. So there's nothing has changed that there's a supply problem issue there, the prices has gone up there. So I think supply-wise, if you look at the global and if you look at the India number here, India has very sufficient, very comfortable level of stocks, around 41 million ton by end of July there. So it's very comfortable level of stocks there. So supply-wise, I don't see any problem in terms of any sort of price crisis or price spike there. I think India put export ban and the market has reacted to that accordingly because India is the largest exporter there. So if you if you go back to what has happened this year, actually, the, if you look at uh, Jan, Ju, Jan, sorry, January to June, India is exactly halfway in terms of what they exported last year. By, by end of June, the exports was around 11 million ton compared to last year, 22 million ton there. If you, if you see projected for the rest of the year with ban in place, I think India will be exporting around 19 million tons of uh, both, you know, they have already exported 5 million tons of non-basmati rice, uh, white rice, I'm talking parabolic rice. 
I think you will see, expect it very natural that you will see increased export of uh, para boiled and basmati rice. We have already seen last two weeks the para boiled rice demand has quite quite a bit increased there. So we are talking about three million tons gap in Indian exports this year. But if you factor Indian exports to the G to G, like Bangladesh, Nepal, Philippines, and some of the African country which have already approached India. For, for, for government to government food security purpose, you will see another two, three million tons of rice export, particularly non basmati, to these countries in the next the rest of the six months there. So I don't expect uh, Indian exports to really go down physically uh, this year. So I think India will export in excess of 20 million tons, 20, 21 million tons there. So you don't ex so I don't expect a lot of uh, a price spike with the given situation, supply situation and market there. But what has happened since then? So the so so we see see a big 25% increase in the parabolic rice between in the last month there around 700,000 tons of parabolic rice has been exported now. So there's the request for early shipment of basmati rice. So the the buyers are concerned that India might take some more action. So they are actually telling that you you deliver it early to us there. Then India, a couple of days ago, they have uh, put a 40% export tax on onion there. So it's India is very finicky because of the election going on, you know, starting from November in some of the state elections, then the general election in March, May there. I really don't expect the export ban to be removed until next May. Irrespective of what happens in the Kharif crops, India will continue to put the export ban, and but also export G2G basis. So they want to control the quantity. There to the so that they have enough rice domestically there. So the effect of the export ban, the whole purpose of India put export ban is to to rein in the domestic price. That has not happened. If you see from from after the after the export ban, actually prices has increased. This is all India average price rice price. Until yesterday, prices continue to rise. There, it's very difficult to rein in the price with the export ban. There, I think that India needs to realize that this policy is not very effective. Uh, in terms of export ban there. So the prices continue to rise domestically, which is a bad news, actually. So what, what you can ex expect now with the Indian the domestic price not declining? So there's a possibility now, very high possibility, India is going to put some restriction on parabol and also basmati rice. So what I hear yesterday, that they're they going to put 20% duty on parabol at the first step, and some of the minimum export price for basmati rice. So that's the first step they will take. Probably we'll see that in the next couple of weeks, this particular policy will be announced. If that doesn't work, then India is going to ban the parabol rice. I think if that happens, then we are looking at some panic in the global market if India takes these extreme steps of um, putting a ban on the on the on the parabol rice and putting a high uh, minimum export price on the basmati rice there. So here you go. My, my take on where we go from here. If India does not take any further action, you know, they keep the export ban on non on non basmati rice until next May. And global prices may go higher depending on the Kharif crop. You know, the wet season crop is the main crop, both South Asia, Southeast Asia, what happens in these close two countries, then extent of production loss in China, which is a major concern, and how China manages its production deficit. Whether they enters the market, then it's a bad news or the managers with the domestic stocks they have there. So that also may affect the global prices there. So it's very unlikely that the price is going to spike or rise quite a bit from where we are today. So I think you, if the Kharif crop is good, we are going to see the prices to be stable at this 600 at that level there. But if India takes further action, which is more, more it looks like more possible now, you know, with, with domestic price not rising, so that might create a panic in the market. India start banning parabol rice. So you, you might see some other exporters might uh, responding to that. Importers might pan panicking that. So you might see a significant price increase or price spike. You know, we are looking at maybe additional 200 to $400 per ton in the price increase we might see there. So, so this is where you know, uh, the market looks like in terms of uh, what is happening, up-to-date information in terms of... Uh, uh, the, the impact of the the Indian ban on the on the on the Indian market and also the global market there. Maybe I'll stop if I don't have time. Then I'll come back later if I have any questions. Yeah, perfect timing. Thanks, Sam. And really interesting to have that inside information of what what's likely to come 
Um, it's not just what the ban we've seen now, but the predictions of, yeah, there might be further further restrictions coming. So very important to have this further discussion. So, um, yeah, thank you, Sam. And we'll go over to our third panellist for this panel, um, for, for David. Um, so, David, um, I'm interested to um, tackle this further, looking at importing countries in other regions as well. Um, so what can importers do to minimise the impact of the shocks um, for example, these export restrictions, and even more if we um, if what Sam sort of predicts happens, um, and how can they deal with the impact even of the El Nino? Um, and also, what are what do you see as advantages or disadvantages to the exporting countries of restricting trade? Because as Sam just gave in the example in India, um, it didn't actually have the effect that they were hoping. So, um, if you can unravel all of this, David, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, yeah, so yeah, export restrictions and um, and the weather, uh, particularly the El Nino that's coming um, or that's here already, are the two biggest factors affecting the world rice market right now. Um, importers are vulnerable, but let me focus a little bit first on on exporters um, because I mean the exporters also have constraints to consider. Um, they can't just impose uh, restrictions without facing consequences in their own uh, domestic markets. Um, and now in theory, there's benefits and costs to export restrictions. Um, the benefits are that they keep prices, domestic prices down. Now, Sam has shown that that hasn't started to happen yet in India. Hopefully it does eventually. I mean, experience based on other export bans show that that or export restrictions uh, do generally um, put some kind of a lid on prices. Um, so hopefully that starts to take effect in, in India soon. But there's, there's also costs that exporters face. Um, they can't just um, impose restrictions without expecting consequences in their own domestic market. Um, the first one is that it hurts their farmers, um, that it it puts a lid on, on the prices received by farmers. And one example of this recently is what happened in Indonesia when they put export restrictions on palm oil. Um, farmers got very upset because, because the domestic prices that they were receiving um, collapsed quite a bit. Um, and so that's, that's one constraint that, that countries have to consider when imposing these export restrictions. Um, Another, cons another consequence that they have to face is that it can erode their market share on the world market. Um, other, when export restrictions are put in place, international prices tend to rise. Other countries want to rush in and, and get some of that market and it erodes the market share of the country imposing the export restriction. And then finally, a, a third consequence is that importing countries see this and they typically then will, they get concerned and they put in place domestic programs to increase production. And that, in, that decreases the overall size of the export market for the exporters because there's a lot of uh, emphasis on becoming self-sufficient. Um, so these, these restrictions or these, these consequences affect exporting countries. Now, they affect different exporting countries differently. Um, and it's mainly the, the magnitude of the impact will depend on the ratio of exports to domestic production. Um, among the four biggest rice exporters, um, Pakistan and Thailand have the biggest share of exports in domestic production. And so I think it, we're the least likely to see those countries impose restrictions because about you know roughly 40% in the case of Thailand or even more in the case of Pakistan of their of their domestic production goes to export and so they're not really helping their domestic food security so much with restrictions um, but they are really hurting their farmers so we're we're not too likely to see export restrictions from those countries now, India and Vietnam uh, 
their share of exports and domestic production is a little bit less, or it's a, it's a fair bit less. It's it's still substantial. It's maybe 15 to 20 percent, or a little bit more. Um, but so that's still s substantial enough to have an impact on on their domestic markets. So they've got to be a little bit a little bit careful. Um, one one reason that we maybe haven't seen the effect on India so far is that they've been trying to be careful and not not impose broad sweeping restrictions um, on, on rice, which is a good thing for the world market, but then maybe has less of an impact on, on their um, domestic price structure. Um, so I think, um, so those, those are the main things I wanted to say about um, exporting countries, just briefly in terms of importing countries, um, because I think that'll be addressed later by, by um, some other speakers. Uh, it will be important to, especially also in terms of, of managing possible impacts of El Nino, it'll be very important to manage water, um, water resources properly, trying to share as best as possible resources between upstream and downstream, because those water resources will be important in the event of the dry conditions that are, are likely, especially in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, Drought tolerant seeds are, are important and, and just longer term, it will be important to invest, you know, for, for importing countries in particular, um, to invest in agricultural research, to increase competitiveness and, and productivity of their domestic farmers so that they, their uh, domestic production situation is healthier. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, David. That was useful. Um, more dimensions to the issues that you brought there. And um, governments may have one particular need for a policy, but then there's all the other external factors that come into play. Um, and then when you ended on talking about also the whole El Nino, which brings in another whole dimension again, and the, the need for the research there. So, so thank you very much. And thank you to Harold, Sam, and David. That finishes panel one session. Um, we only have two panels. So please add your questions um, for any of those panelists as we go uh, while we start the second panel. Um, now, this is going to be, we've talked about a lot of the, the actual issues and concerns that have come from this. Now we're gonna focus a lot more on the solutions. So the second panel is about charting a resilient path, so strategies for ensuring a stable rice trade amidst um, these export disruptions. Um, and it'll be looking at innovative strategies, collaborative approaches um, to navigate this shifting rice um, trade landscape. Um, so allow me to introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, we have Under Secretary Mercedita Sombilla, so Mercy is the Undersecretary for Policy, Planning and Regulations at the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines. And her research areas have included both macro and micro perspectives on agriculture and trade. Lovely to see you again, Mercy. Um, great. Um, now we also have on the panel, Dr. Yuen Du An Tuan. Um, so Yuen is the Director General of the International Cooperation Department, and which is under the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in Vietnam. Um, UN was also previously the Director General of the Institute for Policy and Strategy for Agriculture and Rural Development. So uh, we'll have some excellent insights um, expected from UN. Um, also on the panel, Dr. Flor Denlisa Boudet. So Lisa is the Deputy Executive Director for Special Concerns on the Implementation of Rice Competitive Enhancement Fund for the Philippines Rice Research Institute, uh, more commonly known as Phil Rice. Um, so welcome to you as well, Lisa. And we have a big panel. We have one more panelist. <laughs> um, so we also have Dr. Abdal Ismail. Um, Abdal is IRI's um, Africa Regional Director, um, and um, he's coming in from Kenya there. Hi, Abdal. 
Um, so because we've got a big panel, each panelist has between six to seven minutes in total to answer all the questions that I'll give you. Um, and if necessary, I'll give you a, a little nudge if if, uh, if we need to um, move, move a little faster. Um, but I'd like to start with Mercy. Um, so um, Mercy is our undersecretary, particularly um, important, the insights that you will have, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, we'd like to explore with you these issues um, obviously from the government perspective and policy perspective. So in the context of the Philippines, um, I'd like to ask you, how might government to government deals for rice between the Philippines and other potential exporting countries be impacted? Um, and what economic factors should the Philippines government consider when negotiating such deals to ensure a stable and secure rice supply, which we all want, um, while also mitigating all the risks that arise from the global trade dynamics. And I'm sure the lessons from the Philippines can be really valuable for all countries. So looking forward to hearing hearing your approaches there. Over to you, yeah. Under Secretary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, nice to see you know colleagues from Erie. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, when, when, well, of course, you know, the, 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 the global crisis already started way back 2022, and we have already been seeing, you know, some impact of the, you know, of the, uh, Ukraine, Russia crisis, you know, on, on, uh, on food prices. Then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, this were uh, very much more affected when India uh, announced the export ban sometime in July 2020, uh, in 20 July 2023. And then, of course, we have this impending, which has already been, you know, announced to be really coming in, you know, to be, to be, uh, to, to, to really take, you know, take effect, you know, the El Nino towards the third quarter, towards the fourth quarter, and uh, going into the first quarter of uh, of the of the of the year 2024, so of course the, the the Philippines has always been a net importing country. In the past, in the last last year, we imported something like you know close to three million metric tons. Uh, as of June this year, we have already imported 1.2 1.3 million metric tons. But you know, because of this impending, of this uh, you know, developing events, we really need to secure a little bit more imports. On the production side, we are not re really much, very much concerned because we 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 have already done some interventions. We are more concerned about the the El Nino, which will which is supposed to come in the in the, in the last part of the of the of the of the year. But by then, because of the interventions that we are doing. We have already, you know, uh, uh, put in place, you know, some uh, 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 interventions like early planting, early distribution of seeds. So we're expecting a, a, a harvest even before that the, the El Nino picks uh, at, at that time. So uh, we are still expecting very slight, probably. So you know, on the local side, but still, you know, we need to, you know, to 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 beef up the production. We beef up this local production with the imports. So uh, what we did actually is that, you know, the Republic Act 11203 doesn't allow any more government to government uh, importation. So what we are trying to do now is really to encourage our private sector to do the importation. And there are several interventions that we are, you know, we have uh, been putting in place to do this. Uh, you know, DFA, and you probably have heard about, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, some of the uh, uh, key officials in the Department of Agriculture going to India, you know, to, to really secure the surpluses to be bought by the private sector. And then we are now trying to talk with BOC, our Bureau of Customs, to provide super green lane. So that they, you know, any importers of rice will not, you know, have uh, difficulty getting, you know, the rice uh, imports, you know, into the into the country. And uh, of course, uh, 
we are look, looking also at the, you know, at the extending the EO10. Uh, EO10 provides uh, the same MFN uh, tariff rates to uh, the, the same tariff rates as in Atiga, which is 35%, to MFN country, which is India, Pakistan, and all other countries. So those are the interventions that we are looking at, you know, to to you know encourage more uh, imports, you know, from from other countries. Uh, we have already, uh, I think, the the relationship between the country between the Philippines and the Vietnam is very, very good so that, you know, uh, government uh, agreement for, for more importation from Vietnam will probably, you know, will, 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 will have to happen. There has been, uh, you know, uh, when, when this, uh, when this uh, news broke out about Indian uh, uh, exports being banned, we heard from traders that there were already, you know, some contracts that have been withdrawn by the Vietnamese traders. But I think, you know, with this government uh, uh, relationship, with, with these two government relationships being good, I think we will be able to, you know, to secure, you know, those uh, uh, contracts that have been made earlier, you know, to, to really push through. So in terms of really trying to see, you know, what, what, factors we are, you know, we're looking at in terms of, you know, trying to get this Im imports. Of course, the domestic transparency in terms of the supply and demand. So what we are now, uh, you know, giving to the president, uh, we have already, you know, uh, uh, providing him uh, quarterly, you know, situation of supply and demand so that he would know how to react with, with markets. So he knows exactly how much we would be needing. And he knows exactly when to, to, you know, to talk with the private sector. Uh, the prices, of course, you know, uh, when when we try to will try to negotiate with the government, the, the Department of Foreign Affairs, for example, will try to talk with our Vietnam and uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, partners, you know, to as much as possible give reasonable prices of, <laughs> of right sources. The, the the source of course the distance you know and and uh, the reliability the quality and the safe you know the 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 food uh the the rice uh commodity being safe are, are, are also you know uh being taken into consideration we still provide the uh sanitary phytosanitary import clearances but with RTL the uh, 11 RA 11203 this has been you know uh, very much more automatic so within seven days, it doesn't really, you know, need to be cleared by our Bureau of Plant Industry anymore. So once it lapses the seven days, it's automatically, be, uh, you know, cleared. And the, 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 the clearance, you know, the permit to import is already, would, would already uh, go on, underway. So uh, uh, we are not, you know, as you can see from the uh, presentation uh, or from the, from the presentation of the of previous one, we see already prices leveling off. Uh, so, and uh, I think, you know, the, the the reactions of exporters will probably, you know, at certain levels because of the of the repercussions also that would, you know, uh, the, that would also, you know, uh, uh, take place, you know, in their domestic uh, uh, areas. So uh, I think, you know, uh, right now, uh, the question that was asked of me yesterday is, you know why? Because right now we we only for August and for September we have only about 30, 35 days to last. You know, in terms of our inventory of stocks, and in September it's about 40, 45. And so the question that was asked of me yesterday in the in the uh, hearing is that why if if you say that we are, don't have any shortage in rice, you you say that we have 35, 40. What is your benchmark in terms of really, you know, uh uh, you know, a, a benchmark as to why you, you know, insist to have, you know, to, to get these imports in and said it's for security reasons, you know, in case there are some, you know, um, uh, other events that may take place, which, you know, which are, which we, you know, uh, or which may happen, we at least have a little bit more. So I was, you know, I mentioned something like 40, 50 to 60 days of uh, uh, stock inventory. That is also in preparation for the El Nino event that may really affect the, the domestic uh, production of rice if 
it happens really in in uh, in the first semester of 2024. So I leave at that, uh, 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 Joanna. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much, Under Secretary. And very interesting to see part of your solutions and interventions were both from the public sector as well as the private industry, and bringing those two together to to and by the sounds of it was effective. So yeah, excellent to hear about that. So thank you, Under Secretary. Um, okay, so we'll go to the next um, the next panelist. Um, so Dr. Lisa Bordy, um, we'd like um, we'd like to see if you could focus more on the production side now. Um, and how do you feel that the ban will influence the production strategies and as well as the agricultural policies adopted by the Philippine government, especially in terms of its approach to enhanced domestic rice production and ensuring the food security? And, and the second part is, if um, are there any lessons learned from similar historical instances that can guide the Philippine government, and I expect other governments too, in their decision-making process to effectively respond to, to these sort of external trade dynamics. So over to you, Lisa, thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Erie for inviting me on this very important discussion. Well, just to give you uh, the Philippine context, let me remind you that our country is relatively young in terms of participating in liberalized international trade of rice. Uh, it took us more than two decades to shed our trade policy on quantitative restriction, replace it with tariff, and be more reliant on the global market to augment our local production. So prior to the RTL, Changes in international prices were not that easily transmitted to the domestic market. And even after it is, it has been enacted, the uh, rice tarification law, uh, during the early stage of its implementation, it still takes about two to three months before the changes in the international price to be felt within the domestic market. So it's quite new for us to experience this uh sudden transmission of severe fluctuation in the world price to our domestic market. So when India announced its export ban on non-Basmati white rice, our initial reaction was to wait and see. And after all, uh, the imports of the Philippines coming from India is just less than 1%. Majority of our imports are supplied by our ASEAN neighbors. But it is quite another story when the price of Vietnam and Thai rice have reached the levels of $500 a ton in July and $600 a ton in August. I think many of the import contracts that we have now are being renegotiated and thus the import arrival in the country has dwindled since July and I think it continues until this August. And it is also very unfortunate that this happened during the lean months when our monthly ending stock of rice is very thin as uh, we have the, uh, the harvest season is yet to start in September and it will peak in October, November. Hence, the domestic market is very nervous, which fuels speculations. And just this week, we are hearing farm gate prices of paddy rice of about 23 to 25 pesos per kilogram. And at the retail price, it already breached about 50 pesos per kilogram. So this is uh, already higher than the previous record in July, which is just at 46 pesos per kilogram. So on the other hand, we hope that these high current prices uh, will eventually encourage or stimulate our farmers to produce more, particularly in the short run. And as for our domestic policies to increase our local production, uh, we have been preparing for the imminent impact of the El Nino even before the announcement of the export ban. So. Uh, just this 2023 wet season, we were able to distribute almost 2.4 million bags of certified seed under the combined inbred seed support of the Rice Competitiveness Enhancement Fund and of the DA National Rice Program. And this is expected to plant almost 1.1 million hectares this wet season. 
Similarly, the National Rice Program has positioned hybrid seeds for almost 786,000 hectares, as well as fertilizer discount vouchers to augment the fertilizer application of our farmers. Because of this, we have good expectation for the wet season harvest this 2023, despite the effect of typhoon luxury this uh, last July. We are also about to roll our 2024 production support starting this September. And we about 1.77 million bags of certified input seeds will be distributed again to dry season planters. And this is expected to plant more than 800,000 hectares. In addition, the National Rice Program will also provide hybrid and fertilizer support to another 842,000 hectares in irrigated areas. We are also calibrating our strategies to make this uh, production support more accessible to farmers through clustering approach and government uh, convergence of the government interventions. We are also mainstreaming our climate change adaptation strategies as we intend to increase the production share of the dry season relative to the wet season to minimize the production damage due to inclement weather and typhoons. Similarly, we are improving the targeting of our uh, the targeting of the location of our production support during the dry season, especially with the coming El Nino, so that we will choose areas that are less affected by drought. Finally, we are leveraging digital transformation to efficiently and effectively implement these strategies. Thus, with or without the export ban, the Philippine government will continue its program to improve its local production capacity and consequently the country's food security, especially in rice. I think that will be all that I will share for this afternoon. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. That was fantastic and good to have that case study. Um, obviously, there's a lot of activity to keep production going um, and always going to be critical. So, so thank you. Um, so we'll take a different tack now. We move from the Philippines over to Vietnam and to Dr. Yuen. And also Dr. Yuen's going to give us a little more insight from the private sector perspective. Um, so the private sector has always had a vital role to play in similar global market issues, and we've heard some today. Um, so the question to you, Dr. Yuan, is um, with the Vietnamese government's historical reliance on government-to-government -government agreements for rice trade, how might the export restrictions, restrictions prompt a reconsideration um, to bring the private sector role more strongly into this um, in rice trade and distribution. And also, if you could tackle the issue on what potential benefits and challenges could arise from the increased um, private sector participation in ensuring a stable rice supply for Vietnam. And, and also even how might the government balance its traditional approach with the advantages that the private sector can, can bring um, if they're involved and brought to the table. So, um, I'm Dr. afraid Yuan, that Dr. Are you there? is probably having some technical difficulties. Oh. Uh, or not. So, we might All right. speak to the next panelist and then see if Dr. Nguyen. If, uh, if he comes uh, back. Okay. All right. And if actually, if Dr. Yuan isn't able to come back, if um, if our our board chair, Dr. Fat, would like to even make some comments, that would be great. But otherwise, um, yes, right now we'll move on to um, the final panellists in this panel session, um, Dr. Abdul um, Ismail. So, Abdul, um, we have the advantage now of moving to Africa. Um, and so some insights from Africa would be highly valuable in this. So how do you see that the African governments can effectively leverage government-to-government -government rice trade agreements to bolster domestic rice production and strengthen the regional food security? And also, what role does um, economic cooperation among African nations play in creating a resilient rice trade network that can adapt to that whole global trade fluctuations and ensure a stable rice supply for the continent in Africa. So over to you, Abdul, to learn all about Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you for this opportunity. Um, 
Yeah, let me start with the African paradox. Actually, the continent now hosts over 60% of the world uh, unused arable lands, the largest in the world, but cannot still feed itself. Uh, this is mainly because of low yield, poor farm management practices, distortion of markets, it's really terrible here. And also, um, all of it is leading to dependence on imports of food uh, and agricultural input. And, and rice is one major one because now it started playing a major role in the food security of the continent. So this makes uh, Africa exceptionally more, more fragile and more sensitive to price shocks. Uh, so Saharan Africa about two, two and a half years ago is importing about 5.5 billion dollar equivalent of rice uh, across the whole uh, Sub-Saharan region. Now this year, this climbed to about seven billion dollars per year. So you can see the huge impact already. Uh, and uh, so the gap between clearly the gap between production and consumption is increasing, and it will continue increasing. And especially now, the fragility of Africa uh, actually is reflected in the previous uh, issues that has happened before. And you expect this also to add to that. And this is very clear during the 2007-2008 and also 2010-2011 food uh, price crisis, or where the influence has been shown very clearly on Africa, not only because of the uh, price rise, but also because of the limited resources of the countries to be able to compete in the international trade when the prices are too high. And uh, several countries at that time also involved in power plants, including India. Uh, and the price availability in the international trade market also was, was very low at that time. The second is case is what happened during COVID-19, although initial studies have shown that rice price was not probably severely affected as other food crops, but in some countries it happened, clearly. Uh, increases the price and reduce the availability of rice. And then we have Ukraine crisis, which affected all uh, foods for Africa. And also input, which is very important uh, here in Africa, especially fertilizers, because most of it is imported. And now we are facing this challenge of uh, India ban on non basmati rice, because India is still a major supplier of rice for many countries, especially in West Africa, it's Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, Benin, Togo, Guinea and so on. So we expect this to also start competing in the um, uh, available rice from other countries, which will automatically raise the price for the whole continent. So how can Africa leverage uh, government government uh, trade agreements? I think this is very critical. And actually, this event sometimes could be positive because they trigger uh, uh, countries and also regions to start rethinking their strategies. So uh, the countries in sub-Saharan Africa really now need to improve their local production and quality of their produce. Uh, they have to reduce the production cost and increase competitiveness of the rice that is locally produced to be able to compete with the uh, incoming uh, rice from outside. And I think what happened is rice in Africa is Africa used to aid and also uh, uh, kind of cheap import. And that actually make it very difficult for local production to cope with uh, the quality and price of imported rice. Uh, just to give you an example, since uh, 2000, uh, the average fertilizer used in Africa is about 20 kilograms per hectare. And based on the Abuja declaration in 2006, the countries want to increase that to 50 kilograms per hectare, but it's still the same thing if you compare it to the rise to the, the uh, with the world average of 130 kilograms per hectare. So it, the continent is really lagging behind this aspect. The second thing is uh, the African countries need to build trust between them and to harmonize their agricultural policies and guidelines uh, to remove the tariff and non tariff uh, restrictions that are existing now and affecting the free movement of food commodities, including rice. So I now kind of a free trade in both agricultural input as well as uh, uh, rice seeds and also grain, commercial rice production. Uh, Mahabutu declaration also showed that there should be complete elimination of this uh, restriction, but it still didn't happen. So you see the policies are in place, but are not uh, being implemented well. 
the neighboring countries, uh, countries for sure, they need to harmonize their policies and to collaborate rather than to, to collaborate rather than competing as what is happening right now. And I think this is the only way for Africa really to increase and boost their production. It's really, they have to focus now more on how uh, the continents become self-sufficient or at least regions become self-sufficient in their rice production. The resources are based with respect to water, climate, and land. The other thing is, is also Africa will have to engage more with Asia and other rice producing countries even in Latin America. There are some agreements now with Brazil, for example, so South South collaboration. And one good example that can be quite useful for Africa is the Without Border Initiative history started in Asia. Unfortunately enough, we see a lot of enthusiasm and interest for some African countries, especially from countries under the uh, East African community, try to embrace this agreement. And, and also this will allow them to reach out to varieties and seeds and knowledge from Asian countries as well as being able to share it within uh, the within the, the the region at least. So um, we need to work on adjusting local policies. We need to also look at ways where we can shorten the value chain and streamline it. The objective should be how can we really maximize the benefits for farmers. Now farmers in Africa um, uh, they are getting only about thirty percent of the total revenue of the rice value chain. If you compare this to India, for example, and other Asian countries. We, is more than 60%. So farmers do not have the incentive really to also invest a lot in Africa. The role of economic co cooperation between countries and also countries in regions and among countries across Sub-Saharan Africa and probably continental, uh, I think most of these are in place. There's policies and strategies uh, that have been established for uh, a long time, especially through the um, regional economic communities, including the East Africa community, the SADC, South Africa Development Community, the Comisa, the ECOWAS, EGAD, and so on. So policies are there. They actually allow free movement of fertilizers, free movement of seeds, exchange of knowledge, but these policies have never been implemented. And that is, as I said, mainly Thanks. because of the restrictions that are happening now. The second thing is the, so uh, we'll the continental... You'll have to summarize uh, or, or close, sure. Abdal. Thank you. Uh, this is also at the continental level. Um, uh, we have uh, FARA and others, the UN, the African Union and the African Union Commission also have developed strategies that can help free movement. But most important, what I want to mention is, is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is uh, really excellent, but again, have not been implemented well. And the aim of that one is really to have a one African market with free movement of labor, input, varieties, and seeds. So as you can see, there is lots of opportunities for, for Africa if these uh, uh, regulations are implemented to improve the movement of material, uh, to movement of knowledge, and also to kind of leverage areas where certain crops can be more productive than others. And look at it at regional and also at the continental level rather than at the country level. Okay. So um, other countries see that also rice is really a safety bomb when they can fall uh, back on it. And this is what happened uh, last year here in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, sorry. And there's a lot. I know that it's very hard for you to cover a whole continent and many, many countries. But I think we've got a flavor that was really, really helpful, Abdul. Um, the the whole engagement side still needing for production to increase as well and many aspects. So, so so thanks, Abdul. And um, yeah, I'm really pleased that we have Dr. Yuan Tuan back online. Uh, so, um, Dr. Yuan, um, you were going to give us a perspective from from the Vietnam side and about how the private sector engagement, how things might change in Vietnam, how they might engage the private sector more, what impacts that would have, what benefits and challenges. Um, so over to you, we're interested to hear, hear um, a whole different perspective from Vietnam. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Master. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to get the invitation from Edi uh, to join with a uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, seminar. Um, in Vietnam, I think now I've uh, 
I already received uh, some uh, questions suggested by Zos, and uh, let me prepare a little bit the um, uh, situation of uh, dry spot in Vietnam as well as uh, the uh, policy intention of uh, the government. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, you know that uh, we uh, uh, a good producer of rice and. Um, the uh, even though the uh, area for rice production has been reduced uh, from 4.1 million hectare to uh, at this moment just around 3.8 3.9 million hectare of rice uh, uh, rice land, but uh, with the uh, improved productivity, we still have the uh, growth of uh, total output of rice. So every year, we can export around six to seven billion ton of rice. Uh, um, and uh, with the the quality of Vietnamese dry has been improved uh, a lot. Uh, that's that's one of the reason that now the uh, rice pork price of Vietnam has been increased in the last of five to seven years. Uh, at this moment, more than eighty percent of our uh, uh, family has been uh, uh, using the certified uh, certified seed of rice with high quality. Uh, and uh, for rice uh, production, uh, we are also thinking of how to improve the income of rice farmer uh, by uh, promote more things, uh, you know, high quality rice, but also like intercropping of rice, like rice fish, uh, rice stream, rice with vegetable. So even though we uh, fix the uh, 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 it, by law, we fix the uh, rice land like about 3.5 uh, million hectare of rice land, but uh, uh, farmer can use the rice land quite flexible with like stream, uh, rice stream, rice fish, or rice vegetable, rice vegetable. But they still keep it is the real rice land. So in the case that if, if the market price good, they produce more rice. If the market price not so good, they can reduce. The, the area for rice production and they mix the rice with, you know, uh, stream and fish and vegetable. So with the uh, very good production of rice at this moment in Vietnam, uh, we uh, had no uh, export restriction policy uh, at this point. And our focus, even in the strategy for rice sector, as well as the latest uh, decision by the prime minister that we focus, on uh, improving the quality of rice, uh, try to uh, uh, develop our own branding of rice and try to keep very good uh, relation with our importer, including the Philippines, Indonesia, and also China and other countries. And one of the uh, questions you put for me is that, uh, uh, how can we, I mean, like, uh, Control the rice cost as well as the price of rice if it may have some negative impact on the uh, domestic consumer. In fact, in Vietnam, this moment we have no administrative uh, control policy or intervention into the rice market. Uh, uh, we already removed rice export quota, I think, a long time ago. Instead, we had new decree that we specify some criteria that the rice exporter must comply. Like they must have, you know, some very uh, good uh, uh, storage system, system, they have good relationship or good uh, contract with a farmer group. They can have to ensure certain kind of uh, quality of price before they can uh, register for export. Uh, and I mean, it's, uh, very, uh, um, let's say, uh, a kind of uh, more with uh, uh, market mechanism that, that administrative control the price. And um, we also pro promote the rice for uh, enterprises in different way, like we participate strongly with the market access, especially like with the EU and some other country. Uh, we provide the market information, uh, 
materialize it and we have other type of support in terms of infrastructure, logistics, uh, credit, extension service. And we highly uh, encourage the right exporter to have the, um, let's say, the contract or the value chain integration with Faber Group and the uh, Faber Cooperative. So uh, as our uh, the head of the state already declared very clearly in the UN Food System Summit 2021, that Vietnam would like to become a transparent, responsible, and sustainable supplier of food to the world. So one question people may ask us about how we can, uh, I may stabilize the uh, prior price in the domestic market. Uh, uh, there are two things uh, we, 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 we may apply uh, in the case of, you know, very high right price. Uh, we have uh, a policy of, let's say, storage, or let's say, no, sorry, but reservation of price. Like right exporter or right enterprises, uh, they must, be, uh, they must, uh, let's say, uh, reserve certain percentage of the volume of price that they procure from farmer before they export. So we have uh, also the public uh, reservation uh, system that we uh, ensure in every case we have enough rice for the domestic market. And we have a special policy for the poor, uh, like, uh, like in, especially the poor and ethnic minority in the remote area, like in the forestry sector, we have the food for work program for the uh, forester. Uh, and also uh, policy, especially for the poor, we can uh, provide uh, uh, rice freely to the poor farmer in case of uh, emergency. So that's some story in Vietnam I will share with you. And uh, I'm very open to any questions you have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuan. Um, some big uh, goals that Vietnam has there. Um, okay. so. Um, We've finished with the, the second panel, so and well on time, which is excellent. So it gives a really good amount of time for for um for questions. Um, but I particularly want to thank all the panelists, um, the wealth of insights um that the discussion, you know, truly sort of provides a useful multi-stakeholder regional and country level analysis. Um, and, and what could really supplement and complement ongoing discussions on this matter. Um, so now a reminder for questions, if people can put their questions in the Q&A section, um, anybody can put their questions there. Um, only the, the panelists and organisers can see the questions. Um, and if you can say who you would like the question to go to. And I'd like to ask panellists to answer within one to two minutes so that we can have more questions, uh, which would be good. And I think Marco is going to help with this section with the questions. Um, Marco, um, should we, I mean, Bruce Tolentino had a good broad overview question, which could be useful for- Let's start with that one. What was that? Let's start with that one indeed. Okay, good. So I'll, I'll Bruce... read it out. and. Either, or, or will you want to read it out, Marco? I'm not sure how you wanted to do this. Up to you, but I uh, let me just uh, read it out. Uh, Bruce Tolentino of the Central Bank of the Philippines uh, is asking, and this is for Sam and for uh, Harold, uh, because that, it was asked in that presentation part. He is asking, to what extent has India actually implemented its ban on exports of non-basmati varieties. Are they honoring existing supply agreements? Are they also cognizant of the domestic impacts of such a ban, given the domestic political impacts of an export ban? Now, Sam has already partially answered it, but Sam, you might want to step in and, and, and give us a little bit more insight into this, uh, into this question. Okay, thank you, Marco. Yes, uh, thank you, Bruce, for the question there. Uh, as I wrote, uh, as I answered, uh, India is strictly enforcing commercial 
export ban on non basmati rice i there are news that there are around 200000 tons of cargoes sitting in some airport some ports because of the it came, arrived after the july 20th there but there, as, I, as, I, as I told, uh, there are discussion going on in Bangladesh, Nepal, probably in Philippines, there's a delegation coming, as uh, uh, many of uh, told. So there will be some G2G export, but as of now, there's strict enforcement of export ban of non basmati rice since uh, July 20th there. In terms of domestic, uh, you know, the, the rice, potato, onion, tomato, these are all kind of very essential commodities in Indian, Indian context there. India is, will, will be ruthless, as I said, in terms of imposing any sort of restriction without considering its global implications to ensure that their domestic availability is there, the prices are lower. Because the onion, it's, you know, I, I, think, I think the onion export ban, you see, onion alone can bring down the government if the prices are higher. It is only 30 rupees per kg as compared to in Philippines, it's 200, uh, you know, 200 peso per kg. But consumers are very sensitive to all these basic commodity price there. Uh, I think that domestically they're looking, you know, they 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 want to ensure that the prices of these essential commodities, rice, wheat, uh, potato, tomato, onion, they remain very stable until next May, starting from this month onwards. Thank you, Sam. Then we have a question from Sam, uh, and that question uh, is for. Uh, uh, Tuan, and Sam asks Tuan, uh, could you inform us under what circumstance Vietnam would consider imposing export restrictions? At this moment, we have no intention, no, there's, there's no signal from government to impose the export resistance. That's, that's a, a very clear and concise answer. Thank you very much. Um, please note that if you have further questions, you can use the Q&A function that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, maybe you have some other questions that came to you through some other channels. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Oh, sorry, another question for uh, Tuan, and this comes from uh, uh, Mercedita Sombilla, who asks, Tuan, just wanted to get first-hand info from you. After the announcement of the India export ban, we heard from our importers that contracts made with Vietnamese exporters reneged their contracts. So maybe you could react to the... Okay, can you re re repeat the question again? Uh, okay. you mean the, after the, after the, the announcement of the India export ban, we heard from yeah. our importers that yeah. contracts made with Vietnamese exporters reneged these contracts, so cancelled the contracts. Uh, I mean, it's a very uh, market story uh, because when the you know the uh, when the the um, the company they work uh, with each other, like Vietnamese company, the exporter. They may need to consider both the price they can sell to the importer and the price they have to buy from farmer or from the local trader. So in case that if the the the, uh, the price they they buy from the uh, local farmer is uh, higher than the price that they already negotiated the contract with the importer, I think in this case they. They had to renegotiate or they had to, uh, I mean, uh, they left the, the, the contract. And they even, in that case, I mean, it's just a very uh, commercial um, uh, relationship and they had to pay the fine or uh, other kind of thing. Uh, and I, I don't think that uh, the, uh, such, uh, like the Vietnamese water, they cancel the contract with the importer because of the government policy. It's a very bucket uh, story. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Harold. Harold, uh, why don't you turn your camera and your microphone on so uh, you ask your question instead of me uh, uh, reading it out loud. Go ahead. Thanks, Marco. Sam, I think this is uh, when we're trying to uh, organize this uh, presentation. Uh, in fact, when we had the presentation uh, with uh, with. Yeah, at Erie back uh, last August 7. So 
uh, David actually informed us that, you know, the, I just learned about this agreement between India and, and the Maldives, uh, you know, about this, uh, that they have an agreement uh, that around 118,000 metric tons will be like uh, a commitment by India, you know, so could be exported to the Maldives every year for a period of three years, uh, regardless of any uh, future uh, restrictions that might be put in place, uh, I mean, in the current export ban. So any comments on that? No, India will honor any such of agreement. You know, I was told that Bangladesh, Nepal, Maldives, the rice will be exported through G2G. So this agreement okay. to Maldives is a very strategical country politically also. So I think it will be honored. They have already very clear that G2G and each sort of prior, prior agreement with the government will be honored. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're not off the hook yet, Harold, so stay on camera uh, because we have another question for you and for Sam from Ms. Bourdais. And Ms. Bourdais, why don't you uh, turn on your microphone and your, and your camera so that you can ask the question yourself. Go ahead. I'm just wondering, uh, based on Sam's presentation earlier, that a, a, worst, a worst scenario what could happen if the India would consider banning even the parboiled and the uh, and even the basmati rice. So, how much do you think with the will the international price of rice increase if this happens? Uh, yes, you know, um, Lisa. Uh... It's all about domestic price. India is just hung up on the domestic price to go down. I was told that this month, India has unloaded more than 5 million tons of rice from the food corporation of India. They brought the low regional price down so that there is enough supplies to bring the prices down. It's all about the prices now. Consumer prices, which is continue to be very rigid and does not go down. As I showed, consumer prices continue to, retail prices continue to rise there. If that continues, they're already considering parabolic rice, some sort of export tax at initial stage and minimum export price for Basmati. I don't think Basmati will be banned. Basmati will be still be exported because it's not a sensitive commodity for the majority of the commoners there. But parabolic rice may be banned. You know, eventually the price does not go down, will be banned there. I think, I think it will be, it all, I don't think Indian export ban alone will cause the price spike. Even if the parabolic rice, it all that's the reason I was asking Tuan how, when, under what circumstance Vietnam will react, whether the Indian parabolic rice ban will make them react. You know, Vietnam is one of the country very sensitive to their domestic food security. They're always the first one to put export restriction there. If Vietnam does, Cambodia will do it. Myanmar do it. The three countries they will do it together. They just follow Vietnam there. Then is that ripple effect will have much more impact than Indian export ban alone. You know, it just it will create much more panic uh, that parabolic export ban here there. But India, as I said, India will be ruthless in terms of uh, whatever the policy they can implement to make sure the domestic price goes down. Thank you, Sam. Uh, we have the, the next question also for you, Sam. And uh, that question will be asked by our chair of our board of trustees, Dr. Kal Dukfat. Go ahead, Dr. Dukfat. Uh, uh, thank you. I think any government has objective reason to change policy. Uh, it is not really purely political reason. Uh, so very important for us to, to have clear uh, information or view of uh, rice production around the world. Um, uh, so especially in India, in this case. So would you, Sam, uh, inform us a uh, little bit about um, more about that? And I fully agree with you. If India is going to ban further and international price will go up further, it will lead to increase in domestic prices in Vietnam. If, yeah. uh, in 2008, uh, around end of uh, April 2008, prices, domestic prices of rice in Vietnam almost doubled. And that, in that case, Vietnam government uh, pro, uh, no, banned further signing uh, of contracts 
export contracts. By that time, we signed it 3 million tons. So no further signing. And I fully agree with you. They will be combining uh, of change in India, in Vietnam, and then in Myanmar or someone else. That will lead to yeah. panic. Yeah. We need to to have to have good view of rice production and supply in the world and inform the governments, inform the one community uh, to avoid misinformation. In 2008, there was misinformation. And that why, you know, a panic uh, in many countries. Even in Vietnam, I could not believe that in Vietnam, someone believed, many people believe that we do not have enough rice. Yeah, so, so sorry for taking time. No, no, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fat. Uh, you know, good to see you and uh, good to see you are so active still now uh, in rice there. And uh, I think, uh, let me give you the Indian production situation right now in the Kharib season, which is accounts for nearly 80% of the Indian production. This is the main crop there. Indian production will be normal this year. They will still hit 135 million ton. India, in the last 15 years, they have kind of monsoon proofed the rice. The rice is not impacted by drought anymore that much. You know, there's more than 75% area is irrigated. And main, this main states where rice is produced, main surplus states, the irrigation is 90 to 100% there. So drought has very minimal impact. Last year, India has a very severe drought in major UP, you know, major potato, sorry, rice growing states there. It has no impact on the production. India ended up producing a record production there. So I don't think drought will have much impact on Indian rice production going forward there. So I expect, given that drought is the major concern going ahead now, so, you know, we are kind of out of the flooding, flood season there. I think Indian production will be normal in, in this Karib season there. Uh, many people are speaking about El Nino, but El Nino will take place not at, uh, you know, dry season. Uh, El Nino will be around uh, rainy season, so maybe a little less rain. So in Vietnam, uh, I can inform you that rice production will be at least normal or even higher. Correct. Uh, so, so um, I I think we I would like to ask Iri to have you know uh, over, overview of uh, of rice production around the world and to inform uh, the governments and public. That would be very helpful. I, I really. Uh, afraid of situation as some suggested that that India, Vietnam, and many, many countries do you know you know panic uh, policy change that would be very bad for the world. No, I wrote a blog saying that don't blame India for putting export ban there. Okay, no. India has every right to put export no. ban. They have no, to no. face 1.4 billion people. Exactly. You know, the politics, you know. And and any government would do. Uh, you Correct. know, and this, there is objective reason for that. It's Correct. not really only simple and political consideration. Yeah. All right. And uh, then we have a question out of Africa for uh, Sam and Harold. And that question will be asked by Abdel. Abdel, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Marco. Um, Sam and Harold. Um, there is real panic right now, and uh, African countries probably need some advice. So what will be your advice to them in this situation? Did they really panic, or what kind of policies they should do? Although they are now focusing more on internal production. And the second question is, how about the countries that have already international trade agreements with rice producing countries in exchange of commodities? Do you think these countries will honor these agreements? Harold, do you want to answer? Or? Uh, so I think, well, I, I'll try. So, but I believe Sam, you'll be in the best position. But I think in terms of advice, uh, I remember back in uh, 
2008, no? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure whether still the issue there is uh, for African countries about, you know, uh, low irrigation coverage, high fertilizer costs, and uh, poor uh, transport uh, infrastructure. Uh, maybe those are, during that time, those are constraining the uh, supply response to to, uh, to higher prices. So I think the best advice there is, you know, just to ensure that, you know, there is a high irrigation coverage and, you know, addressing the, the high fertilizer there and improving the in infrastructure. Uh, maybe, you know, both public and, and private investment uh, in irrigation uh, could, you know, could, could help there. Uh, and, um, yeah, I think that uh, when I look at the, uh, the the growth in terms of production, there's still uh, I mean I mean the 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 the, the production growth rates that are, you know required to to hold uh, imports at the current levels are you know are very high. So so to reduce maybe like for example imports at the regional uh, or or subnational le level, then uh, I think that requires a highly uh, improbable. Uh, um, uh, growth rates, uh, uh, you know, uh, to to achieve, uh, uh, you know, high high production uh, growth rates. So, I think I leave to I leave it to Sam to comment on maybe the government to government agreement there in, in Africa. Uh, thank you, Abdel, for for the question. Uh, thank you, Abdel, for your question there. But I think, as I said, India really does not have a production is supply issue domestically. There's you know there's rice in the storage. The rice on the ground, which which is going to be normal production there, uh, I believe that India will continue to export non-basmati through G2G. I think the in the short run, African countries should approach just like Philippine delegation coming to India. African countries should approach India for the food security perspective. I think India will export non-basmati and parboiled rice this, even even if there is a ban there. India will continue the ban until next May. This is my guesstimate. You know, I really don't have the insight. But until the general election is over, despite we have enough production there, they will continue to control the quantity of rice going out of the country. So I think the export ban on white rice particularly will continue until next May, irrespective of the domestic situation there. Uh, you know, for me, I have always argued that I, Asia has kept Africa on the life support. We, you know, Asian country, we subsidize input and keep the production low. So the India can export $400 rice and the African country can never produce $400 rice. So they become dependent on Asia for their rice, impo rice imports there. Somehow African country needs to get the act together. They have land, they have water. They can definitely be producing more rices for their own consumption there. I think the good governance has to play a big role in terms of expanding production there domestically there. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Harold, for answering that question about Africa. I see that there's a, a contribution by our Director General, Ajay Kohli, and it would, of course, be counterproductive career-wise to skip that. So, uh, Ajay, please turn on your microphone and your uh, camera so we can have your contribution. Yeah, but Marco, don't, don't bring in, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the uh, wielding the position effect into this. So uh, I just have a plain question for Sam, and and which is that um, while uh, your emphasis on election-based control of price in India is obviously the main driving factor, um, I I just wonder if if there is a sense uh, in in terms of the other political aspects of you know the much more increased um, uh, imports by China, for example. That's one, and and in in some or the other way, using this as as kind of a muscle flexing for more stronger positions in in certain WTO agreements as well. Uh, just kind of uh, you know, these are tangential aspects from from what we have heard during the discussion today. But do these have a role, or or they don't have a role? I just wanted to get your feedback. Maybe perhaps David also, if he if he has some input into this. Uh, thank you, Ajay. Ajay, I think right now, at this point, that what you said about the political muscles and other, may, may be long term, but right now, India is battling the domestic price inflation, food price inflation. You saw tomato price, onion price. We have export ban on wheat, now partial ban on rice, export tax on onion. So everything, you know, it's all now short run prices, very important from domestic perspective. 
we have election coming in uh, November in MP, some of the key BJP states there, you know, the current production. That goes until next May there. I, I believe right now what India is acting, not any sort of political mileage internationally. It's mostly survival domestically. The food prices, you know, very sensitive uh, in India. The people, you know, the onion price can break the government. They forget about rice. So they are battling the domestic front in terms of the uh, food inflation domestically, how to control it. Thank you, Sam. And then we have a, a question from Dr. Tuan. Dr. Tuan, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, before my question, I just uh, had some command. Uh, I mean, for the, the uh, one uh, international rice market. Uh, I mean, as I remember, it's a very keen market. Total trade of rice has account for less than 20% of the total global output of rice. So just a small intervention by certain government. Um, can make a shock or destabilize the international rice market. Um, so we already see that in the last 15 or 20 years, most of shock coming from government, not like due to drought or to flood somewhere. So I think that we better have more uh, coordination mechanism that sharing uh, information about the supply of, uh, I mean, some certain country, big country, very good analysis, very good projection and advice to government. I think it should be, uh, I mean, it really play a better role in, in this point. Or like in the demand side, I, uh, like in Vietnam, uh, inside the Z2Z, I still remember a suggestion by, by a, a former uh, DC of IFSA, uh, Dr. Duncan Cern, that we should move from the Z2Z contract to a uh, investment partnership like between the Philippines with Vietnam, Indonesia, Vietnam, like okay. You set up the, 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 the investment contract, like you set up the price, the quality, the volume, the time you need, and you put some money. And then our Vietnamese farmer, they are ready to 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 grow rice for you. Uh, so I think it's another way uh, that to to have it a lot to the step uh, to stabilize the, the international rice market as, as well as uh, serving the demand of uh, importing uh, uh, country. And uh, in Vietnam now, we also were working with FAO on also other uh, developed country to establish the South-South uh, cooperation mechanism with African country. I mean, in putting, I already know that Mozambique, uh, Cameroon, Uganda, they, they, they come to Vietnam to uh, ask us to, to promote the South-South cooperation mechanism in uh, dry production. And in the, even in the domestic market, I think in case of uh, dry shortage, I mean, uh, as the, the policy advisor, we may think of how to have more targeted efforts, especially for the poor uh, consumer, as well as for, for the poor farmer to have enough rice in case of emergency. So that's some of my command for how to, to stabilize the rice market as well to have a better uh, market mechanism to work together. And my question here for Sam is that, um, what do you expect in the government to remove the rice spot map? Maybe after the election or, or not? Yeah, yeah, yes, after the election. I don't expect the, the non-Basmati rice export ban to be removed until next May, I would say. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, maybe for the India, in the interest of time, the final uh, question by Ms. Bourdais to uh, David. Ms. Bourdais, please go ahead and turn your camera and your microphone on. Uh, my question is for David. Uh, if he thinks that the temporary lowering of tariff rate in the Philippines be a good uh, instrument to subdue uh, price speculation in our domestic market. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lisa. I mean, in in theory, in theory, that should should help to lower prices. But I worry a little bit about doing it in the current environment, especially now with the rumors that that Sam was talking about of having more restrictions on um, exports from India, um, because because lo lowering those tariffs might contribute to some kind of a sense of of 
create a sense of panic on the international market. That's a, that's a bit too strong, but I think it, it, it moves in that direction. We, I think it's, it can be self-defeating for the Philippines just itself, never mind the effects on other countries. Um, but, but lowering those things may, may fuel a sense of panic. And I, I, I mean, it, it, it depends on what's happening, I guess, to domestic prices in the, in the Philippines. Um, but, but I would be careful, I think, with, and in normal circumstances, I think that would be a good idea. But I think right now I would be careful with doing that. Thank you, Dave. Um, we've gone well over time, but we still have a lot of people online. So I hand over to Joanna for some concluding remarks here. All right, great. Thank you, Marco, and a huge appreciation to our board chair, Dr. Fat, and all the panelists, and of course, all the attendees. Um, we've heard a lot today, so we're not going to summarize, but you know, there's different components that we talked about with the critical role of the public sector, the critical role of having um, relationships globally, the private industry, and we did hear a little bit about, although it would have been nice to have more about even the role of R&D organizations like ERI and the talk about the need for more um, up-to-date critical information um, that's going to impact on those economic forces, how that can impact, how that can contribute to better policy, and also the whole production side, how R&D organisations can help with that. But I think I wanted to end in just one comment, which was mentioned, but it's really important to always bring all of our conversations back to this, that, that to remember that this discussion isn't just about policy or or um, any of the other factors, it's actually about people's livelihoods um, and whether or not they can afford to put food on their plate and not go to bed hungry. And I heard a lot of passion from the panelists and speakers today, um, and we know that why this issue is so critical. So thank you for everybody for your contributions. It was a huge effort for all the organizers to put this together so quickly, and I hope we can do more of this. So thank you. Do well, I have uh, the last one, announcement? One, two, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, um, by the end of this year, we will organize the uh, uh, International Rice Festival in Hausang COVID in the Mekong Delta. So I would like to inform you to and then inform, invite you all to come to join with very important uh, International Rice Festival in Vietnam. The Prime Minister will come and I think he may share some very important declaration about our point of view uh, in the rice market. And uh, I will send you the official letter of invitation later. Here I just would like to inform you that we will on a very important uh, event by the end of this year on International Rice Festival. Thank you very much. Can I just come in uh, for 30 seconds and say that uh, we take very much uh, seriously on board the comment that Dr. Fat made that as a result of this entire um, exercise and, and our understanding, both academic and theoretical and practical and modeling aspects, um, we should really put out as ERI our understanding of the production and supply aspects and, and give out the information, uh, you know, is there anything to worry at all or not? Uh, while we totally understand Sam's uh, guesstimates about the export ban being in place till the next election, uh, we also need to have a clear view on on the uh, supply and the production aspect so that people can make their own uh, guesses and and uh, take that forward. So thank you, Dr. Fat, very much for that. And, and uh, we assure you that we'll work on that as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Arja. Yes, um, good to have some clear action items. So extremely useful. Um, and yes, so don't forget, two big international events. So Vietnam's got a fantastic rice event. Um, and then, of course, the International Rice Congress in the Philippines this year as well in the week of the 16th of October. So two big events. Great to see these happen. And um, good if everyone can be there because this is where we we get find out the latest of what's happening and, and make the networks that are necessary to um to really find the solutions that are important so thanks again everybody have a great day thank you bye-bye thank, bye. thank you bye-bye thanks a lot
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.